everyone. Welcome to Interchange. I'm Dan Jones. As always, lots of interesting things to talk about today. The almost unbelievable amount of media coverage into the John Doe Scott Walker document dump this week. We'll also talk about the not just ongoing but growing problem with illegal immigration now involving so many young children. We will also talk about the continuing argument over whether the team name Redskins is offensive or not. And we will talk about the O.J. Simpson case 20 years later. All right, let me introduce everybody before we get going. Of course, you know Joel McNally, longtime newspaper columnist, and Kevin Fisher, who spent many years as a broadcast journalist, longtime business reporter Avi Lank, now an occasional essayist for WUWM Radio, and Ken Lamke, longtime political reporter. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, let's talk first about the release of the records in the seemingly never-ending, supposedly secret John Doe investigation into Governor Scott Walker and campaign fundraising. They show that Governor Walker is the prime target of prosecutors' allegations. This investigation has already been slapped down by both a state judge, a federal judge, and no charges whatsoever have been issued. So why, Ken, does this continue to be such an amazingly large story? Well, that's a good question. I, I think uh, with the current story, it's primarily because the newspaper uh, is interested in, in it. Uh, now, it, you know, it's not trivial. This is a big-time uh, situation here involving a big-time campaign, a governor. It's not some uh, aldermanic race where somebody forgot to uh, file something on time. Uh, but I have to say, at this point, I, I thought the current story was uh, way overplayed and, and too much attention uh, given to it. Uh, as has been pointed out, as you just said, the two judges have already said there does not appear to be criminal activity here. Uh, there were, I didn't see anything essentially new in the story that merited that amount of coverage. Avi, is your former employer doing a good job journalistically on this, or are they way overboard? They're doing a very good job on it, and it's not just them. This story was on the front page of the New York Times today as well. Well, they messed up on it too, in other words. And, and newspapers and websites all across the country. Who were lazy and just ripped and read what the Journal Sentinel erroneously reported. <laughs> well, first of all, they didn't erroneously report anything. And secondly... Well, they missed the story then. There's an old saw that says when you, when you don't, don't, can't argue the facts, argue the law. Granted that we don't know all the facts because there's still stuff in here that is, hasn't been revealed. But the facts that are laid out that are undisputed by either side uh, draw the picture of an organization where there was coordination, whether it was legal or not, we don't know, but there was coordination between so-called independent groups, the Walker campaign, to the extent, at least according to the prosecutors, of fundraising being done at the same place for both, both organizations and then it being split up. I don't know whether that's legal or illegal. Judges, as Ken rightly pointed out, some have said that it is, that they don't think it's, there's a problem. If it isn't legal, if, it, if it's legal, it should be illegal because it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, and as far as I'm concerned, it's a duck. We ought to know who the people are who are backing these ads. Furthermore, for a judge to say, as, as was said in Judge Randa's opinion, that the First Amendment rights of these people are being violated, therefore stop, is sort of like saying, you're looking into someone who owns a gun, he has a Second Amendment right to own a gun, so stop, and don't go any further and find out, you know, none of these rights are completely absolute. There are circumstances under which you can't own a gun, and there are circumstances under which free speech can be regulated by the government. And for a judge to say, no, stop, you can't go any further and find out whether or not there's something else going on, find that weird. I also understand the complaints that are being made about the tactics used in, in raiding to get, uh, in, get information for this. I would point out that that's standard procedure, and just because it's done to you and not, not somebody who, um, who doesn't have your political connections or, or doesn't have your color of the skin doesn't give you a right to, to complain about it. Let the process go along, and if it turns out that there was a problem, it'll be rememied. That's has, how the law works. Has, has Walker already been damaged, Kevin, even though he hasn't been That's the intent, is to tarnish his image so that and, 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 and people are going after him because they fear him, including, <laughs> the, including the newspaper, uh, that don't want to see him as a formidable candidate two years from now. Um, I'm sorry, uh, my friend, George Mitchell, who used to be a journalist and a darn good one, had a, had a great analysis this week in a piece he wrote where he called this journalistic malpractice. I mean, you have to get to the second to last paragraph 
of a 1,600-word article before the Journal Sentinel even quotes the judge presiding over the investigation as saying there is no, no probable cause that any violations were made of any campaign finance uh, laws. To me, I mean, you don't have to be a first-year journalism student to understand that that's the story here. That's the lead, <laughs> not, this, <laughs> not this screaming headline that got picked up all across the country by lazy journalists who didn't want to do their own yeah, research. Like those, like those who work at the New York Times. Yeah. There's, there's something, there's something hey, else. Now, wait a minute. I didn't wait interrupt you, Avi, all right? You have to get to that second to last paragraph before you get to the, the real story here. And, 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 and there is no story. Now, how six reporters, three of them named, three contributors, and maybe one or two editors didn't understand that is beyond no, me. If you, if you want, if you want I, to get upset at them for something, <laughs> it should be that they never said in the story that Schmitz, the prosecutor, is a Republican. They never said that in there. And also, if you're going to go after Governor, Scott, if you're going to go after Scott yeah, Walker, enough. okay, at least enough, at Kevin. least give him enough, a chance Kevin. to be quoted, not until 270 words into the article. You've, you've oh. had you've had your time. So is uh, uh, this is a national story. It's not just a Journal Sentinel story. That's an absurd idea because all over this country, and I'll, I'll give you uh, several very good reasons why it's a national story. First of all. Uh, the first thing you see is that, in fact, uh, Governor Scott Walker is being investigated for being the center of, a, of what the prosecutors call a criminal scheme. That phrase was what made it a national story. The second thing is that, unlike the first John Doe, when Scott Walker had all of his underlings go to jail and, and not himself, uh, you know, Scott Walker is the center of this case. They actually have an email from Scott Walker to Carl Rove, not only talking about coordinating all this illegal finance stuff, but, bra but bragging about it to Carl Rove, okay? That, that email itself made it a national story. Another thing that made it a national story, in fact, you guys have, several of you have, have referred to some, you know, hallowed judges' opinions. <laughs> one of those hallowed judges. That's the key to the story. One of those hallowed <laughs> judges, uh, uh, Ken Lampke and I happened to have covered at the beginning of his career when he was an assistant city attorney. Mr. And he, and he was an, you know, a, a very conservative assistant city attorney who was appointed by the first George Bush to a federal judgeship uh, and, 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 in fact, as a member of the Federal Society, an extremely right-wing guy. This guy, yeah, not only did he throw out the case, but he, he said, destroy the evidence. If, he, if, if people had acted on his decision, that key piece of evidence, the, the email from Scott Walker himself to Carl Rove talking about the illegal activity would have been destroyed and we'd never know about Again, it. Again, the All story right. is the two judges have said there was no violation of any laws. Uh, yeah, That's right. the story. There, there were, were more judges to come. There were demonstrations in Milwaukee and around the country in recent days to protest the ongoing crackdown by the federal government against immigrants who are in this country illegally. Now the problem is getting even more attention because tens of thousands of kids, children, are flooding through the borders on their way from Central America. The pictures of them being detained are almost heartbreaking. How is this ever going to be resolved? Well, it's certainly not going to be resolved soon, and how, I can't answer that either, and I don't feel bad saying that because it's, the immigration reform has been dragging on for, de well, since the country was formed, we've had an ongoing debate about it, and the, the laws get changed very gradually, and it takes a lot of uh, political uh, will to get something done. So, you know, right now, I think we're on the right track, basically, in that the movement seems to be to increase border security, which I agree should be the first priority, and I would build the wall from Tijuana to uh, wherever it ends in Texas to stop people. But once they're here, whether they're here illegally or not, they are in some sense ours, especially the kids. And so we have to be as empathetic as we can be. And that goes right up to the edge of where you have criminals. If, if you can deport the criminals, fine. I'm okay with that. But it, it's going to be a matter of public opinion working itself out. Uh, Joel, you aren't, you aren't going to put all these kids on buses and send them back. No, you're not. And, and of course, what we need to do is come up with some kind of immigration reform uh, that we were almost on the verge of. Uh, in fact, after uh, the Obama election, when uh, 
the Democrats won 70 percent of the Latino vote, some key Republicans said, we've got to do immigration reform. If we keep turning our backs on these Latino immigrants, you know, trying to criminalize them and deport them and, uh, you know, well, we're never going to win another presidential election in this country. But, of course, they're, you know, because they had whipped up a lot of anti-immigration anti sentiment in the Republican Party, they can't just turn off all those Tea Party haters and, and all those people. So they're not going to do it, especially after uh, Eric Cantor, uh, you know, one of their top leaders, was just kicked out of office by a little-known candidate because he wasn't anti-immigrant enough. Republicans aren't going to do anything. Unfortunately, Barack Obama isn't doing enough either. He's, in fact, deported more Latinos and, uh, and broken up more families than, than George Bush did. Uh, so uh, I think he's... <laughs> Obama's on the right side, but he's moving in such slow motion that, that you know, he's not getting much done either. Uh, I think it's, it's an embarrassment for this country. We, we, we are actually going to be wanting immigrants to this country because we have an, an enormously <coughs> aging population. We're going to need some people working, uh, paying into Social Security for all of us who are going to be retired. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we can't just turn off all that anti-immigration hatred quickly enough. Kevin, whether you agree with it or not, you can almost understand the argument, uh, okay, the people that come from Mexico, you can put them on buses and send them back. What do you do with the kids that came from Central America? Well, we've made that decision. We're going to take care of them, even, even if it's to the point of uh, border patrol agents changing diapers. Uh, we're, we're, we're taking care of all kinds of social services, uh, whether they're gang members or not. And some have said, have admitted to authorities, we are gang members. They're wearing the gang tattoos. But because they haven't committed crimes in the United States, we're sending them on buses and giving them vouchers to spread them out all, all, all over the country. Six-year-old gang members. Right? Well, no, I'm talking about the older ones now, Joel. But but uh, the kids, you know, we're paying a lot for them. The American taxpayer is paying a lot for them. It can be argued and has been argued that we treat them better than we treat our own homeless in, in, in this country. The National Association of Former Border Patrol Officers came out with a statement recently that they think, we talk about Barack Obama here, they think that what's going on now at our borders with this influx of all these kids is contrived, it's orchestrated, it's an assault on the compassion that we have as Americans uh, so that we are using these kids for political purposes. And I, I, I think Barack Obama has a plan and, that's, and that was uh, enhanced by the defeat of Eric Cantor because immigration reform is dead. So the president is going to let this play out. Congress isn't going to do anything. And then I think he's going to issue one executive order after another to encourage illegal immigration. Well, yeah, we or political it, 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 now, now, hold on, hold it, on a sec. Are the parents sending these kids to the United States because they know the United States yes. will do nothing but keep them? All right. Yep. It turns out that I was in the highlands of Guatemala for a week this winter. In the, in, not in the tourist areas, not in the big cities, in the little villages where these people are coming from. And any, anybody, it, it, would, it would behoove people with opinions on this and would behoove policymakers to go and look and see what's going on there. I would ask you to think for a minute what it would take if you were a parent to say to your kid, it, first of all, for these kids from at least Guatemala and I'm sure from the other countries in Central America, to get to the Mexican border, the Mexicans don't want them either. It's extremely difficult for them to get to the point where they can even get into the United States. The poverty, the social structure of these, of these uh, certainly of Guatemala, I can speak from personal experience, is such that to make that kind of a gut-wrenching decision, you do it. You send your kid up here. To, to, to suggest that Barack Obama has emissaries down there spreading the word that there's this land of milk and honey if you'll risk your life going across Texas and scaling a border in the middle of the night to cross a desert is something you ought to put your kid through so that Barack Obama can score political points is absurd. We, we have to take care of these kids. Unfortunately, what you might think you would do would be to talk to the governments of these countries and work out some kind of an arrangement where the kids could be repatriated if that's what you want. But the people, if they're coming from these villages I was in, they wouldn't trust the people in Guatemala City. They trust them less than they trust the U.S. government to deal with them. It's a rational thing, and I agree with Joel, we need this kind of immigration. I wish Congress would decide to have some empathy, gather some real facts, and find a way to attack this in a, in a methodical, rational, helpful way. All right. 
Next topic. A federal agency this week stepped into the fray over whether the Washington Redskins' name and logo are racist, insensitive, and offensive. It canceled the team's rights to the trademark, which, if upheld in court, would cost that team millions of dollars. Is the trademark and the patent office doing its job, or is it just being politically correct while pandering to certain populations? Kevin. Well, why is the office even getting involved in this? Uh, is this a trademark, and that's well, what they do? Uh, apparently, no they file a apparently, apparently at one point, this same office uh, thought that the term Redskins was okay. But no, now, actually, but now, but well, it had to have to uh, to have issued it a long time ago. Uh, a long time ago. But apparently, now they're Indian givers. <laughs> um, uh, this is the same. Really? This is the same office. Really? Hey, this is the a while get this. this is the same office that last year said that the trademark Dago Swamp was okay, and it 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 it, it, it said some other uh, questionable trademarks were okay. Um, well, so it is questionable. Well, if, if you, I, I don't think so. Well, then watch what you say. <laughs> I you mean, just said it was. in 2004, there was a study done of close to 800 Native Americans, granted, 10 years ago. But I think that was the most recent study of its kind and maybe one of the most exhaustive, where they were asked, these Native Americans, do you find the term Redskins offensive? 90% said no. <laughs> so this isn't about Native Americans. This, this, this is about political correctness. This is about uh, uh, an agenda uh, driven by guilty white liberals. The, the owners made it very clear, <laughs> Avi, he is not changing the name. That's right. And, you know, I suppose that he'll have to accept the consequences of that. It's an, it, of course it is an offensive and a racist name. I don't know where the line is, okay? I don't know whether the Cleveland well, Indians... You know, were, this is it? I know this is on the other side of it. That's correct. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Would anybody give a team that name if they were starting it today? Maybe. Sure. Yeah, you I, I, you know, I like I liked that logo the, that Indian had. I mean, that is a dignified, fierce-looking dude. I'm, I'm a Marquette warrior, if, if I may say so, class of 1964. I don't find this name offensive, but I can see where some I mean, people would. What are you you can argue about? I don't think you can argue about this. It's It's... There's a spectrum, and this is a, this is at a far end of it. The, no, well, you got to take it in context. The context of how long it's been in place, what it represents, a team that has treated the logo and Native Americans with dignity, and uh, I, I don't think it's offensive. But again, it's like I was saying about immigration. You need public opinion to get moving on something. The people who object to it should keep up their efforts, and if they can uh, build enough public opinion. It should be decided. If I was a politician and had a vote on it, I would be guided very much, despite the fact that I think it's a fine name, if 80, 90 percent of my constituents thought otherwise, I would be very influenced Is, it, is it the government's business to even be involved? Well, there is, you know, this thing that the Patent Office has of, of whether it sanctions offensive names. And, and I'm amazed that we could have two people uh, suggest that this name isn't offensive. I, I, I understand it's been around a long time. Uh, in fact, that's part of the problem. You know, it, it's been around you know, from days when we would give those sorts of offensive names to teams. But, but I don't think there's much question today. There are sports sections in this country right now which, don't, which won't run the name uh, of, of the Washington team. They just call it Washington uh, because it's offensive. No, and, because and, they're liberal and, writers. And, oh, yeah, a bunch of guilty sports sections. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, the truth of the matter is it is offensive. And and, so? and I can't imagine this particular is owner, particularly now, if, if he's... If, the thing is, you know, if he's going to start losing money now from selling product... <laughs> as a result of this trademark being lifted, that might be enough to get him to and, change and you it. Know, another... you know, being offensive wasn't enough to change it, but, but uh, you know, lose, starting to lose... So, you know, these teams... Maybe he'll become as poor as Hillary Clinton. Sports, sports franchises right. are, left, are toys of millionaires. And we just saw another racist millionaire uh, on the West Coast, uh, you know, show everybody what he was all about. This guy, it's more important to him to keep a name that's always been there. And, and, you know, I, I uh, honestly, I will say that, for the most part, I think the people who defend these offensive and, and names that the Indians complain about, uh, I don't think they're racist. I think they just don't want to change. And times are changing. Yeah. The vocabulary is changing. We don't use the racist terms that we used to use in this country. Uh, and like it's, time, it's time that the Washington team stop using that one. And the, and the truth is... Is it is, offensive to call somebody who's black black? I mean, if they say it is... 
I'll be willing to change but, it, but, but can, can currently the, the you truth can call is a black a that if black. if the name were to change, there would still be people who wouldn't care. You, you you're a Marquette warrior, and there would still be people who would be fans of the Washington R words, and but but it would be nice if he changed it. All right, it really next, would. Next topic. Hard to believe it was 20 years ago we were glued to our TV screens watching authorities chase murder <coughs> suspect O.J. Simpson in the white Ford Bronco. He was found not guilty, but is in prison on totally unrelated charges now. Was that first trial about guilt or innocence, or was it all about white authorities against black criminal suspects? Well, I, when I look back on it, and it is amazing, it was 20 years ago, it yeah. seemed like it was just yeah, a few sure weeks does. ago we were watching it. Um, I, I, I was offended, and I still remain a little offended at, at the cheers out of the black community when O.J. Simpson was acquitted, uh, even though I understood it. Because here they are in, in this white-controlled system where black defendants usually get the short end of everything, and, and we, we know that from the beginning to the end in the criminal justice system. Um, but the thing is, O.J. Simpson wasn't just any black defendant either. He was a, he was a famous celebrity, a millionaire Affluent. with a, you know, the most expensive team of lawyers he could hire. And, and, and also rich people were treated very unequally in, in our criminal justice system. And that was what he got off on. And there were blacks all over this country who celebrated because at last, you know, some prominent black, you know, wasn't screwed over by the system. But, it, but he then, you know, you know, everyone... Everyone, I believe, even, even many of those cheering, you know, felt he was guilty, and, and he ultimately went to prison for other related things. Would it be any different today if there was a similar type case today? Probably not. Uh, it would depend on the character of the individual. I think one of the sad thing, things about the Simpson case is that Simpson has proved to be, I don't know if jerk sounds like too casual a word, but he's not a good guy. He hasn't rehabilitated himself. People. <laughs> well, you know, he could have been drunk, lost his temper, uh, and and then spent the last 20 years really regretting it and making up for it, or, or trying to... Or, try, look, or looking for the killer, try, as he promised. Trying to, to make up for it. Hard to do from jail. Uh, <laughs> so it would depend, uh, I think, a lot, uh, if we had a similar black celebrity case, whether that guy had was a person of character who made a big, bad mistake, you know? It, Kevin, is it also possible that... He had a great legal team? Oh, yeah. Well, they weren't bad, <laughs> but it, it, also to his advantage, you had a stumbling, fumbling, bumbling prosecution team uh, that made all kinds of mistakes. You had a judge who let evidence come in of Detective Furman using the N-word that was very inflammatory, and it was argued in a, uh, a television a news program a week or so ago about the anniversary that from that moment on, the case was over. The, 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 the verdict was going to be uh, a, a not guilty. Um, I, I, I think... He, so you had those two, two factors going. Very good uh, defense team, uh, uh, a prosecution team that made all kinds of mistakes, especially when the evidence was overwhelming against O.J. Simpson. The blood alone from both victims was all over the interior of, of, of Simpson's vehicle. Uh, uh, that, that alone should have, should have, should have uh, put him behind uh, bars. But uh, hang on, Avi. Um, I think, too, what, what happened as a result of this, and it was riveting stuff. I was news director at WTMG Radio at the time, and we had people calling us saying, stop talking about this. We're sick and tired of it. We're not interested in it. Our ratings took a big... Took, took a big jump. It, it, it created, right, me, it, me, it created me, reality TV. It created uh, 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 this insatiable <laughs> thirst for uh, uh, celebrity uh, gossip, which there, is there, bad. Are, there are those of us to whom O.J. Simpson was Bart Starr. If you grew up <laughs> in western New York when I did rooting for the Buffalo Bills... Is he still it was, Bart Starr? It, it, was, it was quite a... I, I've never really gotten over that aspect of it. It was a very... It's bigger than Ryan Braun PEDs that way. <laughs> all right, we move on. True. If you've been online lately, you've probably noticed the map showing all the latest mass shootings in the United States just since the ones in Newtown, Connecticut. Maybe you even asked yourself, well, why don't our political leaders finally do something to stop them? Rick Horowitz used to ask that, too, but now he wonders if the answers have to come from elsewhere. Rick. So this time, will people finally say enough? Actually, people, if you mean the vast majority of the American people, have already said enough. Enough mass murder, enough gun violence, enough gun worship. Unfortunately, Congress isn't inclined to listen to the vast majority. 
not as long as it's the NRA, the gun lobby, that writes the checks and buys the ads and holds congressional careers hostage. So don't hold your breath waiting for courage on Capitol Hill, waiting for stronger, better laws. Is there another way? Maybe so, maybe no. I think cigarettes. Nobody made cigarettes illegal. I mean, there have been some restrictions, selling cigarettes to 10-year-olds, for instance. But cigarettes have stayed a legal product. What changed were social attitudes. Cigarettes stopped being cool, sophisticated. After all, it's hard to look sophisticated when your teeth are rotting and your skin is yellow and you're hacking your lungs out. And once other people, non-smokers, learned about the dangers of secondhand smoke, they couldn't even think of you as harmless. Harmless to anyone but yourself, that is. You were a walking toxic dump. So maybe the invitations dried up. Or if you were invited, they wouldn't let you smoke inside the house. You had to go stand out on the street somewhere. They wouldn't let you near the children. So maybe the smokers decided it wasn't worth all the inconvenience, being excluded, being looked down on, and decided they'd give up the habit. Or maybe they just found other smokers to hang out with. Either way, you could stop worrying. Sounds like a model for how to deal with the gun crowd, right? You want to pack heat? That's your decision. But you're not sitting in my restaurant, in my house. You're not playing with my kids. Here's the problem, though. You tell the smoker he's no longer welcome. He may get upset, even annoyed, but he'll go away. He's not going to take his smoldering butt over to your front door and set the place on fire. The gun nuts, though, the worst of them are already convinced they've been rejected and picked on. They're already furious about missing out on the fun they think everyone else is having. They're already at the boiling point. So the question is, when you tell a gun nut to go away, does he go away or does he go berserk? Thanks, Rick, and thank you so very much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.